Haitians are all of a sudden people. We the people. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. A couple of weeks ago, we were honored to be awarded the Portland Community Media Producer Peer Awards, the uh, area of community free speech. So thanks to all of our crew for making this happen. So our, our guest today is David Young. David Young is with the Jobs with Justice Healthcare Committee uh, and also with Healthcare for All Oregon. Welcome to the program, David. Glad to be here. Right, Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Mm. So you uh, uh, are, are retired now, but before you retired, you were a nurse. Is that right? That's right. I uh, had 30 years as an operating room nurse, most of it right here in Portland at uh, level one trauma centers. And uh, it was very rewarding. Uh -huh. I actually kind of miss it. I. Uh -huh. Thought it was a worthwhile thing to do. Okay, so. great. Yeah, but then this this um, this gave you some background to be concerned about the healthcare system. Oh well, <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, I I spent probably twenty four or more of those years, uh, like I say, working in uh, level one trauma hospitals. Uh, I did a lot of, lot of trauma, it, and one thing that impressed me about that is that everybody, I mean everybody, is just a banana peel away from total disaster, emotional, physical, financial. You, you, th you think you've got things under control, you've got good health, and then all of a sudden something happens and you landed in my operating room. So medical care is something that everybody needs and everybody will probably have a need to avail themselves of sooner or later. The, the other thing that, uh, that happened to me is not only did I do the, the traumas, but I worked in open hearts and cardiovascular a lot. Uh, vascular surgery is diseases of the blood vessels. And if you work in vascular surgery, you also do a lot of amputations. How is that? Well, I was, I, I noticed that I was doing a lot of toe amputations and I knew that these people were practically all diabetics. And I started looking at their charts as we were doing these procedures and I was noticing that they were practically all uninsured. And it finally became apparent what was going on was that diabetics who had no insurance and weren't being treated on a regular basis by their general practitioner, they, di they didn't have a general practitioner, mm -hmm. would be going about their business and then their toe would become numb. And they'd pay no attention because, well, there was no feeling. And then eventually they looked at their toe and it was black. Mm -hmm. And they thought, well, <laughs> this is serious. And they would go to the emergency room. Well, the emergency room people had no choice but to call the vascular surgeon. And the vascular surgeon had no choice but to take the toe off. Mm. The person had gangrene. Uh, and they do as conservative a treatment as they can, so they just take the toe off. But sometimes that's not good enough. And they take off the foot. Mm. And sometimes that's not enough, and they take off the leg, and we, we anguish over whether we should take it off above or below the knee. It's easier to fit a prosthesis on a below-the-knee amputation, and, and it's so sad, and it's so unnecessary because people who have a general practitioner, that is, who have access, that is, who have insurance, can get this treated and avoid all of this. And I found out subsequently that 
American diabetics have three times the amputation rate that European diabetics do. So another way of saying this is that two-thirds of the amputations in this country for diabetics are because the person was an American, because this doesn't happen in Europe. Mm -hmm. People get treated right. over there. Right. So, so something is wrong. And right. So what's, what's, what's the difference between the American system or this system? <laughs> Can't get what you're that. saying is uh, there it, it, is right. no system in the United uh, yes, that's States. What I try to say. And, and the system in Europe. Well, virtually all of the European countries, and, and it goes beyond Europe, it's Taiwan and Japan, uh, they all have established national systems. And, and to be sure, they're all different. They, they range from England, where it's a purely socialist system, which is to say that it's funded by the government and the government owns the hospitals and pays the doctors and the health care providers, to, uh, say, uh, Switzerland and Germany, which uh, also have insurance companies, but the difference there is that the insurance companies are highly regulated and they're not for profit, uh, and the providers are are private as well. And then our non-system, which is pretty much everybody's on their own and mm -hmm. they have to find a way to get a, a medical care and they have to find a way to finance it, whether it's out of pocket or whether their employer provides insurance or what, it's, it's just catch as catch can. Okay, and, and, and so you're, you are an advocate of something called a single payer healthcare system. Yes. And, well, first I try to keep in mind that my goal is one, high quality health care. For two, everybody. At three, a price that we can afford. And towards that end, I think single payer is probably pretty important. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, one of the problems with uh, with saying I'm a single payer advocate is I have to back up and say what single payer yeah, is absolutely. and and talk about health care reform in general and kind of indebted to our good friend Dr. Sam Metz who is as I understand it been on this program before yep, two times and uh, he he came up with a short sketch of what it is and, and he he calls it three questions nine answers. First question, why do we need health care reform? Well, first off, it's because the United States pays twice as much as virtually any other industrial nation for health care, whether on an individual uh, basis per capita or as a percentage of gross domestic product. And, and that would be all right if we also got the best health care in the world. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think that we do, but it's sadly not true. The World Health Organization ranks us in the low 30s, 37th, 39th. We're somewhere between Slovenia and Costa Rica in our health care statistics. Uh, so on, on virtual, the second answer is that the on virtually any scale that you want to devise, we are way down the list in the quality of our health care. And then... Uh, this should be particularly disturbing for most Americans who think that we are the best at almost everything in the world, and that to realize or to hear these facts about where we really are in one of the most mm -hmm. fundamental um, aspects of our lives, our health yes. and our well-being, yes. that we're not anywhere, <laughs> even close to the top. We're no, not close. We, we, we can do way much better. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, we're the only industrialized nation in which people can lose their homes, can go bankrupt over medical bills. My brother has lived in Germany since 1961. His children, my niece and nephew, are both physicians there. And it's totally alien to them. They cannot imagine that people in this in the United States would go bankrupt over medical bills. My my niece uh, emailed me. She said, "I knew it was bad, Uncle David, but 
I had no idea it was that bad. We're starting to get sympathy from overseas. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So that leads to the second of the three questions. What is health care reform? And I, I kind of touched on it earlier. It's universal access to health care regardless of your health, your wealth, or your employment status. We're also virtually the only country in the world where your access to health care depends upon your employment status. And health care reform will lead to lower costs and it'll lead to better public health. And then you, you ask, well, what's the difference between us and the countries that are able to do better than us in costs and in, in health care delivery? And these other countries provide public funding to everybody, regardless of, once again, your health, your wealth, or your employment status. There's no cost sharing. And if the financing is publicly provided, accountable, transparent, and not-for-profit, then, to answer the original question, then you have single-payer health care. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. and, and this national program that was uh, proposed and enacted by Congress, that which is commonly referred to as Obamacare, does that come anywhere close to this standard? Well, I... There are things to like about it, but but it does not meet the three criteria. It doesn't include everybody. It, instead of 40 million people without access to health care, it'll be down to 20 million people without access to health care. Um, uh, it it's, doesn't lower costs. It, it, does provide a bonanza for insurance companies. It's, it suddenly throws millions of more people into a requirement that they purchase health care from the insurance companies. And it it's, does nothing but to improve the quality. So we at Jobs with Justice are kind of taking an arm's length approach to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, it, it's nice that it provides for a lot of health care clinics. We like that. But it's got a few problems, and we're taking a wait-and-see attitude. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. right. And what's, what's happening? I, I know in Vermont they made some recent effort to institute a, uh, a single-payer system there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know that they're, like, doing the due diligence to put that into place. Mm -hmm. uh, or where, where is Oregon at? Well, talking to people around the country, I've, we, we're probably one of about 20 states that are working on a state system or a state approach to health care. The, the way that Canada got their health care, national health care programs, is it started in Saskatchewan in the uh, late 40s. There was a prime minister in that uh, province named Tommy Douglas who said, we can do better and we're going to do better and he established a provincial health care system. And it wasn't very long, just a year or two, and neighboring provinces, Manitoba and Alberta, said, hey, that's working let's do that and it just spread across the country and then the federal government said well it's pretty much a done deal we're going to put a few federal rules on and then each province will do its own system and interestingly the canadian health care system is called medicare oh, uh -huh. and so when the affordable care act passed couple, well, it's been two years now, the, uh, we at Jobs with Justice were rather depressed. We said, what do we do next? And we said, well, if we don't push an Oregon plan, what can we do? So we wanted to keep the issue alive, and we uh, got together with our friends at Physicians for National Health Program, 
and with the Mad as Hell doctors, and with a group from the South Valley called Healthcare for All Oregon that had uh, written the uh, written Measure 23 back in 2002 that was on the ballot and was roundly defeated. And we wrote a bill, it became House Bill 3510. It was introduced into the legislature by Michael Dembro from Portland. We got a committee hearing, which is the best we've ever done before, and uh, now we're on the movement building uh, stage. And we, like getting back to your question, like Vermont, have decided to take a health care as a human right approach. And we're building a movement around that. And interestingly, virtually all of the others, these other countries we've been talking about, have taken a health care as a human rights approach. It was part of the United Nations Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was pushed on the United Nations by the United States. Eleanor Roosevelt went to the United Station, Nations and said, my husband Franklin was working on a new Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. It included freedoms of and freedoms from, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. And freedom from want includes health care. And it was adopted by virtually every other nation in the world except our own. Mm -hmm. And we think that it's time that uh, this nation adopt health care as a human right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this, the uh, House Bill 3510, was that mm -hmm. the bill? Okay, here, here in Oregon that mm -hmm. was introduced by Representative Dembro. Uh, is, is it his intention in the new legislature to introduce that bill again? It, it's our intention to introduce it again in 2013. And uh, if it, we're, we're hoping for a new cast of characters in the uh, legislature that year that would be more sympathetic. Because nothing happened in the Oregon legislature <laughs> yeah. last time with, with the uh, even split between Republicans and Democrats in the House. Uh, if it, doesn't get any traction then, then we'll go to the voters. Okay, in terms of another initiative? Most likely. Uh -huh. And it, whether it, it passes the legislature or not, it will most likely eventually come to the voters, either as a referral or as an initiative. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so if, if, we, if we take the approach that health care is a human right, then does that, is that something that needs to go into the Oregon Constitution? Short answer, I don't know. Okay. I can tell you what Vermont did. They, they, they had had a single payer bill before their legislature for the last 20 years, and every year it went nowhere. And then the Vermont Workers Center, which is Jobs with Justice in Vermont, took the health care as a human right approach. And it started catching on. Uh, you'll notice I'm wearing my health care is a oh, human yes. right uh -huh. button, and I get so many com comments on that. I was just to the Oregon Potter Association uh, ceramic showcase the other day, and everybody wanted one. <laughs> yeah, it's a good looking button. <laughs> artists uh, have a very hard time getting health care insurance. Uh, Anyway, it, it's catching on. I'm finding that it's getting easier and easier to talk to people about health care as a human right. Mm -hmm. it, it just seems to catch. I, I, I'm positive that you can argue about whether it's a right or it's not a right, but I can tell you not having access to health care is not right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, right. so anyway, they, the people in Vermont went to the legislature. They said, "We believe health care is a human right." They uh, don't you? And they had demonstrations. They had petitions, uh, and they established. They passed a bill that said health care is a human right. And what are you going to do it about that? What is the legislature going to do about that? And they told them, you've got to do a study 
you've got to compare different methods. And one of them has to be single payer, one can be what we have, I forget what the other choice was. And they commissioned Dr. Shao from MIT, who established Taiwan's healthcare system, to do a study to see how they were going to finance healthcare as a human right. And he came back with a study that said, yes, healthcare, uh, yes, that single payer is the way to go. And so that was the second phase. The legislature adopted that attitude. Okay, all right, and so you brought up the financing. Mm -hmm. So it seems like if we're really going to cover everybody, that that would be tremendously expensive. How, how does it get financed? Well. Well, one cannot argue that it's not tremendously expensive. And <laughs> one can point out that the United States has the most expensive health care in the world, just short of 18% of gross domestic product is devoted to medical care in this country. The second most expensive country is Switzerland at 12%, and it goes down to 8% in other countries. And and it, it's literally killing us. It's wrecking the economy. So we really can't. We really can't continue to afford to have this program of not covering everybody. It's another way of putting it. Uh -huh. Well said. Uh, so it's our contention that we can cover everybody for no more than we're paying now, and we're already the most expensive country uh -huh. in the world. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, I'm not sure that you can really answer this, but in terms of a, a, a whole new system in which we cover everybody, uh, it sounds like we're talking about then all the doctors and so forth would submit their bills to to the to the state government, uh, and then where does the money? I mean. Where does the money come from? So well, first, exactly let me say it. that it's not going to be free. Uh -huh. And your taxes will probably go up. And we ran into a very interesting statistic. At the rate that health insurance premiums are going up right now, by the year 2025, all of your non-tax premiums are going all of your non-tax income is going to go to uh, health insurance bills. Mm -hmm. So obviously something's got to give, and <laughs> let's say they're only half right, only half of your <laughs> income's going to be going to bills. So um, yes, your taxes are going to go up, but you will no longer pay premiums or co-pays or deductibles. I think that's a pretty good trade-off. Uh -huh, right. And then the other, the other you know, plus is that you won't be going bankrupt no. from getting good health care. No. Right. Okay. And so you're judging from your first comments where you're talking about the diabetics and the amputations. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a uh, single payer would really emphasize preventive health care. No question. It, and as a matter of fact, countries that have universal health care find it saves a lot of money to do prevention. Under our present system, people change insurance companies approximately every five to six years. So the insurance companies do not emphasize prevention. Why should they put out money when the next company is going to reap the benefits? Oh yes, right. So they don't do it. Uh -huh. but. It behooves a country where the tax system's taking care of the medical care to get ahead of the diabetes mm -hmm. that's sending people to the operating room to have their toes amputated. Yeah, okay, great. Mm -hmm. Who all is involved in this, in, this, in this effort to do this here in Oregon? We have recently constituted a coalition of uh, so far 46 uh, groups are on board, including your own Alliance for Democracy. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. We have several uh, labor unions. We have faith groups. We have uh, nonprofits involved. And uh, 
we probably uh, represent uh, between 75 and 100,000 uh, people right now. The Oregon Education Association's on board, the Oregon Nurses Association's on board, American Federation of Teachers. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think, think when we've I look got at a the, good underpinning. Uh, yeah, I, I mm. think I remember seeing AFSCME uh, Council 75 on mm. there. And, yeah, yeah, service exactly, employees. Right, but unions yeah. are, are getting tired of trading away raises for what they hope will keep their members above water uh, yeah. on health care. Uh, right, yeah. And, and it's interesting development because mm -hmm. labor unions used to look at that as this is what uh, one of the benefits of belonging to a union was that you got health care. And, and so uh, sometimes they opposed single payer systems. So now they really have come around. M most uh, most contract disputes now center around health care. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So if we can take that off, right. the, it would lead to a little more right. uh, labor peace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. how, real quickly, how do, how do people get involved with your, with your coalition? People are somehow attracted, <laughs> and, and I suggest that uh, you go to our website, singlepayeroregon.org, uh, and uh, click through it, get hold of us. You can get hold of Jobs with Justice in Portland, Oregon, and uh, come to our health care committee meetings. Uh, we, we're building a movement. We want to know who you are. We want you to be part of the uh, movement. And we're all organizers, you and me. And you cannot organize a movement if you not don't know whom you're organizing. So please let us know who you okay. are. All right. And you're still looking for additional coalition organizations oh, and so forth. To be sure, right. and and okay. more are coming on board yeah. all the time. Small businesses, local businesses. As a matter of fact. Uh, uh, Anybody who's an independent contractor, musicians, artists, uh, uh, realtors, uh, architects, uh, waiters and waitresses, uh, all have trouble getting health insurance. Okay, mm -hmm. great, good. Thank you very much for being here, David. It's my pleasure, please. Great. Thanks for having good. me on. All right, mm -hmm. good. So we've been talking with David Young with uh, the Jobs mm -hmm. with Justice Healthcare Committee uh, about single payer health care nationally and here in Oregon. For more information, uh, please go to either the uh, singlepayeroregon.org website or to the pnhp.org. Uh, PNHP stands for Physicians for a National Health Program. Two books of interest, Deadly Spin by Wendell uh, Porter and the Potter. He uh, Potter, The Healing of America uh, is the second uh, book that we would recommend. Uh, we want to thank our crew today, Roger Bates, Dave King, Janet Morris, Joan Horton, and Tom Thomas. And thank you to the audience for watching, and we'll see you again next week. Bye.